Well, thank you for affording me this one opportunity I'll have all weekend to actually talk to Patrice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to let him do most of the talking. I'll, I'll try to just occasionally say something if he, if he starts to flag. In the unlikely event that he runs out of something to talk about, I'll try to feed him something else. But what I wanted, to, what I thought would be an interesting place to start would be uh, when, certainly when I was younger, Robert E. Howard was not exactly a uh, notable presence on the bookshelves uh, in the states. Now I don't know what it was like in France, but how in the world did did you become a Robert E. Howard fan? Uh, I suspect the uh, my first meeting with Bob Howard in France was uh, just the way it was for everyone in France for the comic books, the Marvel Comics adaptation. Those were translated in France in the late 70s. And so at the time I was what you would call in the States a Marvel zombie. So I was buying everything Marvel and even Conan. Even though this was not a superhero, he, there's a spandex. I bought, a, I bought one. It was a French translation of one of the early Savage Sword black and white, beautiful stuff, and I absolutely hated that. I mean, where's Spider-Man? But since I was a zombie, I bought the next issue, next out in the graphic novel, actually, and I loved it. And so I started buying all of them, and one day I discovered the, uh, the French translations to the Lancer books, you know, the one you had in the States in the 60s, and these came out in France in the early 19, 1980s. Sorry. And the very first story I read in there was a Tower of the Elephant. And I think, wow. And so after that, I started trying finding other uh, Robert Howard stories. And it so happens that in France at the time, we had this huge Howard boom with the Neil collection. And to this day, there is no single collection in the world which is so complete. We had 30, 35 volumes of hard stories, nearly everything except the Western, because the Western would never sell in France. And so I start, and these books came out at a rate of, I think it was one every other month. So for three years, I was on a constant diet of hard stuff. And within three years, I bought my first English paperbacks because I wanted to get the Westerns. So I got them in English to read them. And that was the beginning of the story. And. Uh then you went on to study English. And then I went on to study English. So the first year at the uni university, I had this professor. He was a great guy. And at the end of the year, he was the guy who was, um, uh, I was, he was the one who was interrogating me for my exam. And at the end, he had a program on fantastic literature. He had done a thesis on Blackwood. And so at the end, he mentioned, I mentioned Howard to him. He said, why don't you write? A master's degree dissertation in Howard. Come on, it's not Hemingway, it's not, you know, in France you have to do something on Hemingway, Shakespeare, or George Orwell, but Robert Howard? I said, yeah, do that. Uh, when you arrive in your fourth year, come back to me, and I'll be the one who is going to help you do the dissertation. And that's what I did. And he kept his word. So thanks to him, I did this, and then the, the, the two years later, I wrote. Um, you would call that kind of pre-doctoral thesis on Bob Howard in France. I would think I was the first one to do that in my country. Yeah. And uh, what was it on? Uh, was it general or I, specific You want the topic? French title? Yeah. Yeah. Barbarie et civilisation dans l'œuvre de Robert E. Howard. <laughs> you just made that up, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> and and the, um, uh, the, the second was in French, the first was in English, and it's called Death and Decay in the works of Robert Howard. I haven't read that since the day I wrote it. Actually. <laughs> Maybe it's bad. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> but it was a dissertation. It was. Um, and so what led you to America? Uh, so uh, when I was about to write, uh, that dissertation and I got a scholarship fund and my first okay wh what am I going to do with that money and so okay no I'm going to go to Texas and so 25 years ago I flew to Cross Plains uh, so I could meet Glenn come to Cross Plains go to Brownwood meet people and you know research material for the dissertation I tell you the truth, there was not much that I could use for a PhD paper, but I mean, I got here, and so I got to meet people, 
And uh, I was introduced to um, that guy, I forget his name, tall guy, bearded. Tall, yeah. uh, what is his name? Rusty something? I think the so. The name escapes me. Randy. Randy. Uh, Randy. Yeah. Yeah. Girk. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of lots of things because he mentioned Rehoop at the time. That there, guy. there are some pretty funny stories associated with your first trip to America, though. Why don't, why don't you tell them a little of that? Uh, I sure. think I will save them for later today. Okay. <laughs> Be sure to come to tonight, uh, tonight's <laughs> dinner. You know, kind of stories the French have on the Americans, or vice versa. <laughs> uh, travel, just, just say travel's a little different in America than he expected. Um, so then you started getting into more and more Howard scholarship. You yeah. published a, a zine in uh in Rehupa at first, mm -hmm. and then in France I did uh, a fanzine, two issues of the fanzine. That was in the early 1990s. And then I wrote the uh, dissertation, and then I moved to Rehupa and forget the exact chronology. And then in 1997 uh, I published my two first two real essays, one in the, the Darkman, on the, the, it was titled The Birth of Conan. And it I wanted to show that the birth of Conan was not the birth of the character, but the birth of a literary creation. So, so how uh, did, how do to create this character when he created in 1932? And the other one in James Van Eyes, The Fantastic Worlds of Robert Howard, where like this longish essay on quite a number of topics, Curl, Bran McMahon, Conan, The Kings of the Night, something like that? Yeah. That was the one uh, inspired by Steve Trout's Dark yes, Man article. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, which was an expansion of something I'd done in Rupa. Yeah, We are getting fairly esoteric here. <laughs> <laughs> um, s and so speaking of the birth of Conan, is that the beginning of your interest in uh, getting in, really getting into the typescripts? Probably, yeah. Um, I know that uh, very early on, I asked Glenn Law to send me copies of the letters because at the time, those had not yet been published. And th when I met Glenn for the first time, he had given me a few copies. And so I think I thought that this was interesting. And then he started sending me other stuff, and some of these were uh, copies that Glenn had retyped from the originals, and some were copies of the originals. And one day, and I can remember the exact day you were with me, it was Halloween 1990, and we had dinner with Glenn, and he, he gave me a bunch of pages like that, and that was the REHHPL correspondence, most of it. And no one had seen that, and it was all from the originals. And then later, that same evening, we started comparing, I think, the, the copies you had and the copies I had, and we saw there were differences in there. Oh, that passage is not here, but it's in the original. So I, from that moment on, I suspected that sometimes it was best to to find the originals and to, to, to get to see it, to study it for yourself. And so I started asking Glenn for copies. And that was the, at the time, it was only you know, 30, 50, 40 pages every other month. And after a while, I simply couldn't get enough. And so uh, I asked Glenn, Glenn, what sh I, I'm going to send you money because you are making me all these copies. And uh, he said, no, I don't want any money, but sh just send me books, foreign books. Uh, on Bob Hart, okay, and that's what I did. I found them books from Estonia, Russia, wherever. I'd been, this was pre-internet, so it was very difficult to look at the copies. And uh, after, I don't know, eight, ten years, I ended up with something like 10,000 copies, something like that. Don't you have them in, a, in binders or something? I used to have that, and now I have scans, so I'm slowly <laughs> digitizing the whole thing because, it, you know, it took them so that big. I remember going to your apartment and seeing a very, very long shelf of bound yep. Howard type scripts. I have 50 yeah. or 60 of those. So yeah. Yeah, I have I have the letters in loose leaf binders. They're about, uh -huh. about that much. But, um, so you got into the type scripts and then you started noticing peculiarities in them. Yep, I did. So go, th go through that process a little bit of how you I don't remember how it came about, but I know it, uh, it began when one day I noticed um, an oddity on a page, and it was kind of an inverted crescent, 
and I started noticing that that crescent was also found on in other instances. And so I started analyzing all the pages I had and discovered that this crescent uh, started appearing uh, in around early 1928. And this was one line and a half below uh, a, quot um, a quotation mark, if someone? I think it was a quotation mark. Quotation mark. And so every time Howard would type a quotation mark, one, one line and a half below, you would see the inverted crescent. And, but it began only in March 1928. At first, it was very sporadic. And then it became prevalent. All pages that. And so I, I thought, that's cool. Because if I have a page uh, in which there are crescents, it means that the page is, was typed after March 1928. And after a while, I started discovering other things. And for instance, the way how I would spell a word. For example, it spelled horizon with two, R, two R's until June 1931, and then it got the, the right spelling. So I knew that if I had an horizon in a story and it is, was spelled with two R's, it meant that this, the, the, that page, that story, that letter, whatever, was typed before 1931. And so I accumulated something like on the 40, 50 different things which helped me date the type script because no one had done that before, and I thought that was something which had to be done because it's very important to organize the stories in the order that they were written. And then somebody noticed that you were pretty good at figuring out when, what order certain typescripts had been written in and thought maybe you should take a look at the Conan. Yeah, stories. that Gurk guy. <laughs> it changed my life. Uh, if you were here today, I think <laughs> I, I should thank him. <laughs> But, I mean, that's really the, uh, a big part of the reason that I asked you to be the editor for the Wandering Star Conans was... Not big. Was I, the I thought it was because I was French. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you were French meant that that editor guy had to do a good deal more of the proofreading than he might yeah. have uh, <laughs> otherwise. But, um, but because you were so knowledgeable about those typescripts and the order in which they'd been written and... The, and well, I have to play with each other. It was just it was a no-brainer to ask you to edit the books. Well, play. thank you, but I think that establishing the writing date and the chronology of types is what essential. I mean, if you if you want to show the evolution of how as a writer and to show that the importance here is not the life of Conan, but the uh, how's growth as a, as a writer of note, it was you have to publish the stories in the stories in the order that they were written. For me, it was. Obvious. I mean, there was no discussing that. And I can't remember who it was I was talking to. It might have been Scott. Was it Scott Valerie? Were you the one I was talking to um, about who you were saying that reading them in the order they were written was just a complete revelation? Um, it, it just changes your perspective on the character altogether. Um, it because, does. Because you realize he, was, he knew from the outset that he was going to be a king. And it just changes your perspective on how the whole thing uh, but works. Ima imagine you have never heard of Conan before. You read the first story, and you uh, you should read the stories about this barbarian guy and his sword. And you, you you begin Phoenix and the Sword, and you see, oh, here is the barbarian with his pen. It's a very different take on the character. Yeah. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the editing process or how you? So uh, uh, the uh, my motto was we should go for the TypeScript. The, fir the TypeScript first. Howard's final version of the story is to be our version. And if there was a contradiction between one story and another, we let the contradiction in because that was how Howard typed the story. And uh, we were adamant about that because we knew we had behind us a history of people tampering with the story, the characters whatever. So we didn't want that. And we wanted the stories to be published exactly as he wrote them. So when we had the TypeScript, we went for the TypeScript. When we had the carbons, we went for the carbons. And we had the weird tilt text, we went for the weird tilt text. I mean, the process was simple. You go for the best available source. So one of the things I did was I knew there were a few Conan TypeScripts out there owned by private collectors. So I went after them. And I managed to get copies of those as well. And uh, some of these proved to be very important. I remember when I got the, the first draft of Phoenix on the Soul, 
and it has this very important chapter when Conan gets drunk at the end. I think they, this and this made it to the final book because it's in the back section. But it's it's a very important chapter which to me helps define who was Conan at the beginning. Because it it shows the giant melancholies. Much because than, yeah, than, than the, the uh, short yeah. Nemedian, uh, what's the, the Nemedian Chronicles, Nemedian Chronicles segment. Yeah. So we wanted to, the, the aim was to show that um, the Conan stories were literature and not escapees. It was not the story of the guy who, rise, who rises from a thief to, uh, to a king. That would have been Sprague the King. <laughs> uh, but uh, who, who, it's the story of a writer and who begin the story of Conan as a king and then he starts having other interests and so the, the, the stories move just like that and there is no order. It's not, it's not the saga of a barbarian. It's about Howard using this character as a um, catalyst to telling the stories he wanted to tell. The, the, these are, most of the Conan stories are not about Conan. They are about events and people and Conan arrives and his arrival sets the story in motion. It's not about Conan. You don't have any single Conan stories in which a type, you have Conan in title. It's Red Nails, Beyond the Black River. It's not Conan the Valerius, Conan the, the Plumber, Conan the whatever. <laughs> um, where was I going to go with this next I don't question? know. Um, we should have rehearsed that. Yeah, yeah we should. <laughs> um, I think we could open it up for your questions, if anybody has something they'd like to ask Patrice. Go ahead, Ed. Oh, I, I, I think you already answered that, how he got involved with Wandering Star. And it wasn't the Conans that were the first. No. It was... Uh, it was before that. Yeah, it was Solomon Cain and... Uh, no, Bob I wasn't involved in Solomon Cain. Uh, the first one I worked on was in The Ultimate Triumph. So imagine you are a Frenchman and this guy, Gurk, ask you, oh, I know you wrote something on uh, barbarism and civilization. That was my second uh, university paper. And I would like to, to use that for that book. And this, this is a book, the best Bob Hart stories illustrated by Frank Frazetta. So do you accept to be featured in the book in which you have Frazetta and Hart? So I said, yes. Of course. And so what I did, I wrote this 12,000 word. And this is my essay. So it's very complicated stuff, very you know, scholarly stuff. And so Marcelo and Rusty see that, and they see that and say, you got to get that. It's like, okay. And so I reduced it to 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> and send that in. I'm not going to make it. Okay, I, I must have sent an email which says something like, okay, here is a synopsis, and it was 8,000, <laughs> and <laughs> I got the 8,000 more than that. So, and this is uh, how I, my first professional publication was in the Ultimate Shrine. Very proud of that. Yep? What was it about Tower of the Elephant that made you become a, a Howard fan? What, do you, do you have any the sense of wonder. The sense of wonder. I mean, uh, I read that story, and I, you, I could almost see the stars in the Ibarian sky. I mean, it's just poetic stuff. I mean, I, I was telling someone yesterday. Uh, I'm not sure if I read the story before uh, or after the the one by the camp, the thing in the monolith or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I know that I read that at some point, but I don't remember if I read the Conan's, the the hard story before or after. But anyway. The Decamp story left no impression whatsoever on me. I mean, I can barely remember reading that. But the Howard story, Tower of the Elephant, just blew me away. Wow, this is beautiful. It was a beautiful step for me. And it still is. I mean, it's still one of my favorite kind of stories. I want to just real quickly, we'll get to your question. I want to uh, real quickly say that Patrice says he wasn't involved in the Solomon Cain book or anything, but Patrice and I have been uh, close to being best friends in Howard fandom since what 1988 or 89 or whenever that first meeting was and we emailed each other all the time whenever I had questions about things I'd bounce them off of Patrice and he would bounce questions off of me so to say he wasn't involved is not 
entirely true because he was. Hey, my, I didn't get a copy of the book. He's been my advisor. <laughs> I had to buy my copy. How can you say that? <laughs> we weren't giving them away like candy, no. <laughs> uh, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering in, when I was reading uh, Hyborian Genesis, you talk about uh, Barnsworth Wright's tendency to uh, censor Howard mm -hmm. and, and specifically not that much with story content but dialogue. Yep. Um, can you give us any examples of, of like, what Barnsworth Wright objected to? What Profanity uh, and sexual allusions. That's it. Uh, for example, in Beyond the Black River, you had the, the fat merchant, I forget his name. Someone? Tiberius. That's it. And he was um, a fat fool in the Weird Tales version, and he was a bastard in the typescript. And um, you add this thing about, I forget the stories, but in People with Black Circle, or yeah. <sighs> maybe Red Nails, I don't remember, but everything too overtly sexual was simply censored, removed. In, in People of the Black Circle, when Conan kidnaps the Debbie, he calls Chunder's son a bastard. Out of yeah, and yet, you know, the slur words were turned down. Uh, that, but that would be all. I mean, I got lucky enough in, uh, for one story, which is A Witch Shall Be Born, for which we have the Weirdest text, the carbon, and the typescript. So we have the three versions in a story which has some clear sexual overtones. And so I could see exactly how and where rights editing began and ended. So it was very clear cut. It's always in the dialogues and always, you know, silent editing. So it's just one word, two words that were excised and that's it. No others. When Wright had a problem with the a particular aspect of the story, he would simply send it back to Bob. Okay, this story is good, but I want you to rewrite chapter one because it doesn't work. Rewrite it. That's what he did with the Phoenix on the Soul, for example. So if he had objections, real objections to a story, he would send it back, rewrite it. But of course, for one or two lines of dialogues, we're going to do that, so just get the words. Um, obviously, you've studied his prose quite extensively. And you've noticed the patterns of evolution in them very, very perspicuously, if that's a real word. But have you been able to read his poetry and discover similar patterns of evolution in his poetic work? Uh, I wish I could do that. The problem is we have no idea as to the datation of the poems because they are so short, it's really impossible for me to, to, to give them and to assign them a proper date. Uh, I was happy to, to do that for the Tempter because we have a draft for the Tempter and I could see that it dates from some, uh, well, draft is from somewhere between mid-1929 and late-1929. So it was not a poem which was written in 1936 as he was, as he was, about, as he was about sorry, to commit suicide. And, but for most of them, for the 725 others, there's really no way of knowing when he wrote them except that when he mentions them or they're in a letter or something like that. There's no way we can uh, ascribe a writing chronology evolution to the poems. Plus, we know that he would retype one or revamp some of them, so it's really impossible to ask. I mean, if someone can do that, I would clearly love to see that. Um, one quick thing about the tempter. Was that about a real woman? Or not, I'm sorry, I'm thinking, never mind. Yeah. Uh, to a woman, as I was thinking of. The tempter, we know what that's about. So never mind, wrong call. Uh, how different is it reading Howard in English compared to reading him in French? Is it, how ah, that's, uh, that's, that's a tricky question. Uh, at the time, uh, when I first read on French, and we had this translator, uh, which I found was excellent, because I was reading the stories and, you know, he had the pace right. I mean, it was fast, 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 I mean, just couldn't turn the page quickly enough. But then, as I became a translator later on, I had at one moment the occasion to work on these old trans uh, translations, and they were bad, most of them, because there were many problems with the text and with the fact that the, the, the other translators were not familiar with the stories or with many things. And so um, you, you would see huge difference. I know the way I translate how it has nothing to do with the previous versions. And my only recollection of reading those stories of style was these stories, they are fast. And when I read, I switched to English, you have to remember that I was 
18 or something like that when I switched to reading in English. It fr and it was a Western, so it's not very easy for a Frenchman. But it took me a while to get used to it. But uh, I found the same level of energy uh, in the originals and I had found in French. I wasn't surprised. It was the same writer. So there was no surprise about that. I mean, it was not uh, a case of a translator uh, altering or um, you know the tone of the original because that happens a lot in France. You have people, translators, who, who like to impose their own style on the original, uh, and sometimes change the story. We have one guy who is famous for adding new twist endings to the uh, <laughs> Vilcadic stories published oh in French, and say, "Oh, I'm gonna read the ending." So, <laughs> In a similar way, is there anything from um, either pastiches or comics or something where you know you were alluding in a general sense earlier to how uh, Howard's vision for say Conan wasn't in mind with with other people that, that took it? Can you give any specifics where you go? Yeah, that was a misfire. They didn't understand the character. Uh, how it was. Just had to read the stories. When well, you just I read know, the story, hey. But then, anything that, that I mean, I mean, out okay. that or you know, just Conan. Okay, I need to think about this. I, I have this strategy. I'm going to do that, and so the satrap is going to go there. This is not Conan, okay. for example. I mean, uh, is someone who would act instinctively. He was not you know, going to plan ahead. I, I'm going to become a king when I'm in my forties. Mm -hmm. No way. So that kind of stuff. But I stopped reading passages really very early on because I discovered it mess with my brain in a way. I, I, I did that when I was having this discussion. This was many years ago with someone and I was wondering if at the end of Queen of the Black Coast Conan cried or not because I was misremembering things from the Conan comic. And at the end we see Conan shedding one tear. I'm sad. This was in the, in the end said, no, that's in the comic, not in the original story. So um, I wanted to keep my brain and solid. So I stopped reading those. One exception, the Carl Wagner con Road of Kings, which I found was okay. That's it. Yeah. Yes, can you think of any examples where Farnsworth writes recommendations uh, improved upon Howard's uh, drafts? Many times, uh, actually. Um, in Black Colossus, we don't have proof of that, but I suspect that um, Wright asked him to shorten the battle at the end, and I think, uh, judging from the pages we had, I think it was an improvement of the story. Um, not on the Conan's, but there's one um, of the historicals, the one where the guy, uh, forget the title, in which you have the crusader and the, the, the boy. Um, the one can, and the, uh, we have the, the, the boy is captured with the last crusader, and the boy is killed oh, or yeah. whipped. Um, uh, forget. Lord of Samarkand. No, uh, that's no, it's uh, uh, Lion of Tiberius. And that's Lion of Tiberius, yeah. And the, in the original, you had 10 pages of battle before, mm. which were, you know, clutter the story. So Wright asked him to cut that, and, and the story is much more, uh, uh, it's much better. I mean, just because you begin the story with this very dramatic scene of the, the boy dying. Well, a prime example is... Uh, the opening, the Nemedian Chronicles opening to Phoenix on the Sword. That was, that took the place of an entire first chapter. Wright asked him to condense that. It was what he had, like a whole description of the Hyborian world. Oh, right. And Wright's like, we don't need a geography lesson to start a story. So um, Howard wrote the Nemedian Chronicles sec section, which is probably one of the most famous bits of writing that he did. And we wouldn't have that if it hadn't been for Wright sending the story back and saying, fix that. Oh, Barbara? Um, it happened in his poetry also. In the writer for Loom, uh, Wright made it a league beyond the western wind, a mile beyond the moon, and Howard had written a league beyond the western moon, a mile behind the moon. And the, with putting the beyond in both places made it a lot more powerful of poem. Cool. Um, Talking about translations, uh, there was an interesting uh, problem that <coughs> Patrice sent me once. Idioms don't always translate directly in, in languages. And Patrice sent me an email saying, all right, in The Phoenix on the Sword, Howard 
kills Vilmana and he says, I'll know that dwarf in hell. Does he mean, I'll recognize him when I get to hell? Does he mean that dwarf is going to hell? What, you know, and he, he gave me like three options. He said, what does it mean? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he means all of those things. Um, what, how did, I, you, I remember that, how did you end up translating that, by the way? Uh, because um, when the uh, the books were out in in uh, in American England with the world of on that race, I say, oh, I think it would be a good idea to do that in France. You know, be a prophet in my own country. And so I started approaching the French publishers and uh, say, okay, here is the books, and maybe you want to do that. And say, are you going to translate it? No, I'm not a translator. I have never translated anything in my life, so it's not my job. And after a while, uh, I said, OK, you find one, but I want to oversee the translation. I want to read what is going to translate, because I want to be sure it's going to be as faithful as possible to the original. And after a while, I realized that no one, I, w I wouldn't be satisfied with anyone. So it, I became a translator. I had been a translator. I know I had been a translator, a teacher, or whatever, just like Conan. I've never been that before, so I'd not try it. And now you're a big media star in no, I'm st I want to do that, yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Are you saving that for your talk tonight, or do you want to talk a little bit about can, what you're we doing? Can, we can talk about that. Okay. About what? About what you're doing in France. So I'm trying to, um, I shall put that, to um, spread the good word. And uh, now that the books are out in France and that Howard in France seven years ago, he was no one, and today he is recognized as a pioneer, I'm a founding father. That's the, 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 the expression people use for the stories, which is real good. Um, if I want to, um, to give you um, some numbers, the, uh, the first Conan book in France had a print run, and now we are in our fourth printing, sorry, and uh, uh, the first print run, it was a hardcover, 8,000 copies. At 35 euros, that would be 50 bucks. So that's a very expensive cover. And uh, 8,000 print run for a country, which is, I don't know, 20%, we have you know, 60 something million people. So that's way less than you had. And it sold out in six months. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, it's as if a hardcover book in the States would sell out 50,000 copies. Who does that? Stephen King, maybe? Yeah. I mean, that was impressive. And so today, the, um, I am working on documentary on Bob Harden. I am uh, involved as an advisor on a board game. Uh, so these people came out to me and they said, OK, we want to do a, a Conan game, uh, but we want that game to be as faithful as possible to Bob Hart. That's the thing they asked me. because. Four or five years before, or ten years before, no one uh, would do that. They would go with whatever kind of. But here, they wanted to be the, the game as faithful as possible for a board game uh, to their stories and to the characters uh, created by Bob Howard. So that's the kind of stuff I do. I try to be. I've done something like I don't know, forty interviews. I've been on national TV, radio, websites, web blogs, podcasts. I mean. Every time someone asks me for an interview, I say yes, you know, because I have always have something to say. It's always good to spread the word. You won a pretty prestigious award, right? I won the um, the special award at the Imaginal, and the Imaginal is the closest equipment we have to the World Fantasy Convention. So it's huge in France. I mean, they have something like thirty thousand visitors, so it's huge for the three or four days. And uh, I was awarded that. The special award of the jury for my work on the on the Conan, and the Howard books, sorry, all the, the whole collection. Um, how many Howard books have you done? The ten, the no, ten are out, and the eleventh is coming out in six days from now, and the twelfth is going to be in the works real soon. Okay, and there will be more. I hope. So. You're going to actually do more volumes than Naya. That's my <laughs> objective. I want to outdo you. Uh, <laughs> How many you got? Eleven? I don't. I, I haven't counted. Yeah, you know. No, I, I you don't want to. <laughs> no, but are, you, are you going to uh, do? No, I, I don't want to do everything anyway. Are you going to outdo Neo? Or are you going to? Uh, you what? Are you going to outdo Neo? In number? Neo? I wanted to do twelve first, and 
I think I'm going to stop there. You're not going to do the Westerns? In France? No one would buy a Western. <laughs> I would love to do that. It's funny the Germans like Westerns, but, yeah. the, but the French don't? No, they don't. I mean, if you sell five copies, that would be a good thing. No, I wanted to, but uh, there's no way I can do that. Because, well, the, the, in France, the, the book publishing market is having a real problem. So, 10 years ago, it would have been possible, but today, no way. Rusty, there's uh, been a request in the back that you guys use microphones. Have trouble hearing you. One, two, one. One, two, one, two. I sound like an alien. I mean, from outer space, no? You do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Too many questions. Matt? Yeah, I had a question about uh, the relative popularity in France of Clark Ashton Smith, H.P. Lovecraft, and Robert E. Howard. How is it changing over time? It's changing, yeah. Uh, Loft, oh, I hear the sound of my voice. <clears throat> Lovecraft is huge in France and has been since the late 1960s. So, in, started in 69 in France when we had this first book, serious book, on, on Lovecraft. And so it was helped by the uh, role playing game, the Call of Cthulhu thing. And, and he is becoming mainstream. Uh, Howard used to be cult in the 1980s, forgotten in the 90s, and uh, even in the early uh, years of this um, other two case. And nor it is becoming, you know, the founding father, I was telling you, Clark Ashton Smith is entirely forgotten. And he had a brief spark of success in the mid-1980s because of Neo books, the, the one who were publishing the, the Conan stories. And uh, there are uh, publishers interested in uh, uh, doing uh, Smith in France, and I, they actually asked me to do the translations. And uh, if they watch this video, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it down the shot. Uh, but um, it's not huge anymore. I mean, no one knows him except people in their 40s or 50s who read the stories back in the day. But it, the, um, the problem with this, I, sus I suspect it's the same here in the States, is that Lovecraft at Cthulhu, how does Conan and Smith has nothing to, you know, for the average Joe public to, to, to know who he is. That's his problem, if I can say it's a problem. I think Ed had a question. Yeah, you're, um, I, I've seen you do some uh, Howard genealogy. How did you find those Butler pictures of Howard as a pirate? Uh, just like everything else, I search. You know, I spent I spent my life searching things and finding things. So. Um, How did you know about that? Did you know they existed? One day I was reading um, some of the camp's interviews and the and the one from the Butlers. I forget for what reason I was reading that. And the, the interview begins with um, I think it's Mrs. Butler saying that. Oh, I remember we had uh, seeing those pictures of Bob Hart as a pirate and with uh, with uh, Leroy and Faustin, and they were grown ups, and but they were dressed as pirates. And I gave the picture to, and she started mentioning that the pictures had been given to someone, and then Catherine began, as usual, as <laughs> usual, interrupt and say, "Oh, does anyone want some more coffee or whatever?" and and the conversation was lost, and they didn't get back on track. So I found that, okay, and I started trying to, to hand down the, uh, the, the, the ancestors and the, the, the Butler family. And I found one guy who turned out to be the son of the guy I was looking for. And he said, I always write, hey, hello, I'm a Frenchman, and, I'm, and it's, it works all the time because you're a friend. Why is someone from France writing to me? So the answer, because I never say why, I contact them. Just want to, you know, to browse the curiosity. And so, and don't you have um, old pictures in your place? And I would need to, to know if you have people, um, pictures of um, family members and as pirates. What are you talking about? Let me check. And the next day, you were right. <laughs> and that's it. And so he sent me, he sent me the, the scans. Uh, you, you have all seen. And one year later, he sent me out of the blue the one with Esther and Patches. He said, oh, I found that. Maybe you're, maybe you're interested in that. And that you just have to, if you want to find something, just have to look for it. Ask Rob. <laughs> look. <laughs>
Okay. Scott? Yeah. Patrice, um, That's me. What have you noticed, because you've studied the text so thoroughly, in, in Howard's maturation as a writer? Like, how, does, how did his growing mastery manifest itself? Was he better at plotting? Was he better at pacing? And the other thing, the second part of this is, I think humor is really hard to write about. And is that one of his aspects of mastery, is being able to write the humorous westerns and not have them fall flat? Um, about humor, uh, Harry is one of the very rare writers or uh, artists um, who can make me laugh out loud. Otherwise, I, I laugh silently when I read something. But when I read the Costigans or the Elkins, I mean, I burst out laughing because. But I don't know how to, to how he does that. I just know he does it. That's it. I never try to analyze the, the, the way he, someone makes me laugh. I laugh. That's it. And the other question was about the maturation. I think I understood that uh, not when I studied the stories, but when I became a translator. Because when you translate someone, you get to actually study everything because you have to know how it works and how you can uh, work your way out. And so how can you make that French? Because that's difficult and you have to, to do that without betraying the style. And the, the and you no, he has. He had the way to put the right word at the right place without slowing down the pace. It's not, you know, it's not. It's not. It's very easy reading. It's deceptive. Deceptive. Simple. Deceptive. Yeah. Deceptive. That's a long word. <laughs> and uh, it's deceptive. Yes, it seems simple when you read it, <laughs> but it isn't. Not at all. So it, it was. I don't know if it was crafting that or if it was mostly a, a matter of and conscious growth or whatever, but he did it. And uh, when he was uh, writing, and when he was flowing, I mean, you can feel that when you translate the story. Uh, one example I have is when I translated uh, Scarlet Citadel, and there was this long passage in the underground, which I find so boring. And it took me five days to go three pages. And then when I was translating Heart Dragon, and there was a set chapter where Conan takes over the ship with the blacks. I translated the whole chapter in one draft in three hours. Just like that. Because the prose, you know, it, it flowed like that. And it was the same for me as a reader and translator. I just did that. I reread what I wrote. And it was good. You know, a tie for two, and that was it. Um, I guess this is kind of the opposite question. It seems like with a lot of writers, as life goes by, their career goes by, and they may mature in some areas, but in other areas, kind of when they when they have that youthful passion that doesn't know better, that some of their best stuff comes out and they start to lose that over time. Did you see anything in the earlier stories that was, you know, powerful in that regard? That he, he had the energy, but um, after a while, he, he, he knew how to um, master that. I mean, when you read Idol of the Eons, for example, it's full of ideas. It's only ideas. There's no real story. You can make any sense of that story. After a while, he could use those creative bursts of energy and uh, weave those into a story. That's what I think he was best at. But did you, did you see anything? I guess what I'm asking is, I mean, was there anything that kind of over, over the course of life and a career beating you down that was lost over time? I don't think so. That's a tough question, but just from the top of my head, I don't see anything. Maybe you do. Um, I'm only going to say that I think um, the question is whether or not Howard lost something over the course of his career. Like there's this, there is in his early work a really youthful exuberance of ideas. Um, and he actually says that, I think, in, about Red Shadow, not Red Shadows, uh, which story is it? This, I, I sure mixed slavers and drunkards and harlots. Wolf's head. That's Wolf's head. Wolf's head. Um, and you just get this sense of, of barely restrained creativity. You know, it's just, it's, he's bursting with it. But what he, what, what he learned to do is control it. Um, so I don't think there's less creativity or anything as he goes along. He just masters his tools. Mm -hmm for keeping it under control, which is what a good writer should do. When do you think you became a mature writer? Can you hmm. For me, it, it, it all came to the, 
me all came together in March 1930 when you wrote a uh, dark man called Spartacus and Kings of the Night. I, I think there were elements before or after, but for me, it was in 1930. Made a transition, but that's just me. And if you ask me the same question tomorrow, I may, maybe I have a different answer. Maybe Red Shadows, because Red Shadows is so good, but I don't know if he, if he knew, if he understood what he was doing in Red Shadows, because this is a very important story. I, mean, I don't care about history, I don't care about setting. I, mean, I, mean, I read the story. You just can't mix uh, 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 continents, time periods like that. Yes, it could. Yes, it did. One last question, or before you arrived, I asked Rusty about his Robert E. Howard biography. Uh, when is yours going to be ready? Uh, one of these days. Uh, act, act, actually, I'm on. Uh, I am going to to go on a different journey in, in October because I'm going to write a thesis, PhD thesis on Bob Howard. So, um, and I very happy with you one of these days. I'm still young. <laughs> <laughs>